hear a conversation. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions one to seven. Rita speaking. What should I do for you? Oh hi. I'd like to order some stationery. Could I know your name? Jackson Paris. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, Jackson? Sure. The number is six nine two four double one. Six nine two four double one, right? And you're from Rainbow Computer? No, the company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, okay. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, Jackson? Envelopes. We need a box of A4. That is normal size envelopes. White, yellow, or Manila? We'll have the plain white, please. But the ones with the little windows. Okay, one box, A4, white. Just one box, was it? Um, on second thoughts, make those two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. As a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white then. Something else, Jackson? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are five hundred sheets on the pack. Let me see. We're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists. So can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. Anything else that we can help you with? Let me think. What else do we need? I'm sure there was something else. Ends, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. That's all right. I'm not paying anyway. Right, floppy disks. What about diaries next year? We've got them in stock already, and it's a good idea to order early. No, I think we're all right for diaries, but something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. Okay, can you include a wall calendar then with the other stuff? Just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. Now you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen to the next part of the conversation, and answer questions eight to ten. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't. But would you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. Can you make sure that it's not after eleven thirty a.m. because we have to go out at twelve? There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine, I'll make a note in the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past eleven. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. Listen to the conversation between two students, John and Carol. They have a list of the names of authors whose books have been given to the library. They have to classify the authors as writers of cookery, sports, or travel books. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. This is a great collection of books, isn't it? Very impressive. Who gave them to us? Apparently, the donor was a book reviewer. There are a lot of books about sport. Here's one: My Life in Cricket. Well, that's certainly sports. Who's the author? Peter Adams. He also wrote Journeys Through Spain. Did he? Peter Adams writes books on both sports and travel, so S T is written against his name. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to eight. This is a great collection of books, isn't it? Very impressive. Who gave them to us? Apparently, the donor was a book reviewer. There are a lot of books about sport. Here's one: My Life in Cricket. Well, that's certainly sports. Who's the author? Peter Adams. He also wrote Journeys Through Spain. Did he? Next one is Stephen Bow. He wrote Summer Barbecues, Cooking for Singles, Dinners by Candlelight. Anything else? No. Do you have anything by Pam Campbell? Wanderings in Greece, my life in Russia, travels in the Amazon, and Pam Campbell's guide to a successful trip.、Oh, sounds like she got around. My next one is C. Ketsik. He has a list of books about football, the World Cup, heroes of the World Cup, playing with the round ball, soccer for everyone. That's enough. He was a one-topic writer. Ari Hussain, however, wrote about cooking and travel. His series of cookbooks is called "Living and Cooking in Spain," "Living and Cooking in China," "Living and Cooking in Brazil." He's been everywhere. I've got a specialist here, Sally Innes on tennis. Here are some of her titles: "Improve Your Serve," "Tennis for Everyone," "Tennis Forever." Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Sally Innes on tennis. Here are some of her titles: "Improve Your Serve," "Tennis for Everyone," "Tennis Forever." Meg Jorgensen has three books, one in each category: "Cooking for Health," "Sport is Good for You," and "Travelling in Australia." A varied talent. Who's next? Bruno Murray. He wrote children's books, a whole series called *The Child's Guide to*, and then *The Name of the City*. Oh, you mean like *A Child's Guide to London*? Yes, that's right. He seems to have stayed in Europe. Ruby Lee, however, has just one book. It's called *The Emerald Isle*, and it's all about Ireland. Apparently, she went around Ireland on foot. Jim Wells wouldn't like that. His books are all about motor racing. Hmm. Nice photos of old racing cars. Don't you love the goggles on the driver? They do look strange, don't they? I think we're nearly finished. What did Helen Young write? Summer menus, food for thought. She also did a book of Chinese recipes, 
Cantonese, I think. Okay, that's dealt with the first box. Let's stop for a minute. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty one to twenty six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty one to twenty six. Hello, my name is Emiliano. I am a student here, and I like to rent a house for six months. Okay, well you have come to the right place. We specialize in short term rental. First of all, I would like to get a few details from you. Can you give me your full name, please? Yes, it is Emiliano Nespla. And can you tell me your present address, please? Yes. It's seventeen Middle Way, Penrose. I'm living with a homestay family at the moment. That's great. Now, do you have any identification with you? Oh, and we will need a reference from someone who knows you here. Maybe your homestay family. Yes. Okay. Here's my passport and a card from my language school. My reference can be Mrs. Alice Thompson. She's my homestay mother, and she would mind. I'm sure you can contact her at the same address as me, of course. Okay. If we need to contact you, should we leave a message with your homestay? No, you can speak to me directly. My cell phone number is o two one five four eight three five three four. Great. Now, do you have a bank account? You will need to pay your rent by direct debit. You know, it will come out of your account automatically every month. Okay, I don't have my bank account details with me now, but I can get them and bring them back later today. That's fine. Now, can you tell me what kind of house you are looking for? Do you want to rent by yourself? No, I'm looking for a three-bedroom house. I want to rent with my two friends. I will bring them in to see you later today. Okay. And what areas are you interested in renting in? Well, here's a map. Can you see my school? I don't have a car, so I need to take some kind of public transport to school, and I don't want to travel for more than thirty minutes each way. Do you think you have anything which is suitable? Yes, we do. Here is a list of available properties. I'll highlight the ones that could be of interest to you. Look at the map and go and have a look at the houses with your friends. Do you have a friend with a car? Yes, I do. Good. So go and look outside the houses. It will give you an idea of what the area is like. But remember, don't go into the garden or knock on the door. If you want to go in and have a look, let me know and we can arrange an appointment. Okay. Can you give me an idea of price? Yes. If you look at the list, you can see the weekly rent written next to the house address. Oh yes, I can see it now. Do I need to pay anything else? Yes, you need to pay a deposit, which you will get back when you move out, and you have to pay a non-refundable agent fee, which is equivalent to one week's rent. You will have to pay your bills when they come in every month too, of course. Okay, well, thank you very much for your help. What time should I come back with my friends and my bank details? How about two thirty this afternoon? That sounds good. Thank you for your help. I'll see you later. Thanks for coming in. Goodbye. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty.
Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Hey, don't throw that can away. Why not? I've finished with it. Yes, but you can recycle things like that. Oh, I haven't got time to recycle everything I throw away. That's a terrible attitude. Don't you care about... Hello, you two. Hi, John. What are you arguing about? Oh, Sam says he doesn't have time to recycle. What do you think? Well, I agree that it can be difficult sometimes. Do you always recycle everything then, Mary? Yes, I think everyone should. I mean, look at the state of the planet. If we don't all start making an effort now, it could be too late. Well, one of the reasons I don't recycle as often as I should is that I don't really know where to go. There are no recycling facilities near me. Well, I know I said I haven't got time, but actually there is a bottle bank near the supermarket just up the road. So I suppose there are limited local facilities. So you can do your recycling outside the supermarket? Yes, but like I said, only limited. It's only a bottle bank. Well, I don't have a car, so it's very difficult for me, but I still do it. Sometimes a friend comes over and we take our recycling together, but not very often. So if your facilities are limited, then mine are very limited. Well, I suppose if you go to all that trouble, I might make more of an effort. Good. If it was up to me, I'd encourage more people to recycle. How? Well, how about some kind of incentive? A reward for anyone who makes an effort to recycle. That's a good idea. But if you think everyone should recycle, then why not penalise those who don't recycle instead of giving something to people that do? If there was a fine for anyone caught throwing recyclable materials in the rubbish, people would take more notice. Well, now you're going too far. Do you really want anyone going through your rubbish just to check if you're following the rules? No, I don't think fines are a good idea. Well, I think we should be doing something. Anyway, I have to go. I've got my social science class next. See you later. Yeah, see you later. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about developments in public transport in large cities. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 31 to 34. That big cities around the world are getting bigger is a clear trend. This situation is going to make the issue of transport increasingly important. Cities cannot work if their people and their visitors cannot move around. This means that public transport is vital to the success of cities. And yet, private car ownership is increasing all the time. Can these two facts be contained in the same reality? Isn't the car slowly but surely strangling the city? But we must acknowledge it does have genuine benefits. Having said that, the fact that car owners can escape to the mountains is of little relevance to the issue of daily city life, in which we need to do things like ferry heavy shopping and luggage around, something the car, of course, is invaluable for. But the so-called family car is rarely occupied by a family, just a single driver taking up a lot of road space. It's not only the car that clogs up our roads, of course. Trucks are heavy, noisy and smelly intruders. But it's hard to persuade companies to opt for rail freight rather than road. They argue that it is cheaper and more flexible. 
and trucks are undoubtedly able to go when you want, where you want. The cost claim is false, however. Truck companies don't hold themselves responsible for the environmental costs they incur, nor are they keen to calculate the time spent on repairs or delays. So, this is our first challenge, the sheer volume of traffic. If we compare three developed and urbanised countries, we can see interesting differences. The UK, for example, has just over 20 million cars, one for every three people approximately, and nearly three million buses and trucks. These figures sound very high, but in fact the Netherlands, although only a little over a quarter the population, has more vehicles per head of population. Meanwhile, Germany, bigger than both other countries put together, actually outstrips either in terms of vehicles per head of population. Now, there is no correlation between these figures and the percentages of journeys made on public transport. This means that the route to better public transport use is not abolishing the car, but rather making public transport better. Not surprisingly, where people can choose, they choose the thing they prefer, not the thing they don't. How do people judge public transport? Well, a major survey was carried out this year indicating that there are many aspects, from clean interiors of buses to the proximity of routes to homes and workplaces. Fair prices is a complex issue and needs to be accounted with car costs. What people seem to find most frustrating is scheduling. If the route doesn't pass their departure point when it suits them, they'll drive instead. The issue of personal safety seems to have reduced in urgency with better lighting at stops and CCTV. Now, various measures are being taken in a number of major cities, all designed to increase the appeal of public transport and thus to persuade car users to leave their cars behind and free up the city's roads. Among these is bringing in smart cards. These are purchased in advance and mean passengers spend less time waiting to buy tickets and board buses and trains, particularly when switching across transport modes within the same journey. Another initiative is the use of computers in managing scheduling with greater efficiency. But such logistical measures are not sufficient in themselves, and indeed the benefits that they bring are often less apparent to passengers than to transport managers. From the passenger's point of view, the fact that buses are becoming more comfortable is significant, because it brings them more in line with the car. Delays and diversions are, of course, deeply irritating for passengers. Even if these can't be eliminated, ensuring that passengers have more detailed information available to them will help to reduce their sense of stress. We often associate public transport with inner-city travel, but of direct benefit to passengers are systems such as taxi-sharing and dial-a-bus, which provide more flexible options for suburban journeys. And finally, Nothing really significant can happen without a shift in people's mindsets. The way we travel is an expression of our values about many things. Companies operating public transport are slowly but surely finding it possible to sell their services as a public-spirited alternative to the car, as awareness of environmental issues has increased radically in the last few years. Overall, then, this combination of steps and changes has a good chance of shifting the city out of the car and onto the bus and train. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.